first thing to think about here is the very name of Gygus. The name of Gygus is itself something to reckon with. Gygus. Does that name at all ring a bell to anybody or remind you of anything by chance? It comes from the root word get, which for us is Gaia. Gaia. It's a reduplication of Gaia. The Gaga, Gaga. Like baby talk. Gaga. We do Gaga. Gaga. And Gaigez, this baby of a man, begins the story. The beginning of our sort of spiritual journey through the Republic, so to speak, of being born into the Republic. This is the same thing as this word we saw in the Odyssey. Ogigia. Who lived on Ogigia? Calypso. That's where Odysseus begins his spiritual journey. He's trapped on Ogigia. He's bound to that earthly element that Calypso represents. Just as Gaigez, earth man, Gaia, is bound or trapped at the beginning of this journey through the Republic. Gaigez is himself a Lydian shepherd. Lydian part, man, nah, doesn't necessarily have to go over that too much with you, although it has to do with uh, Heracles. But he's a shepherd. Why would that be significant? In that same work of the Odyssey, do we know of another character that herded sheep? Is there another character that cared for sheep and brought them back to the cave every night? The Cyclops. There you go. That's that new Cyclops. What's the name? Polyphene. The shepherd immediately connects him to, to Polyphemus, the many-voiced one, Polyphemus. So you have a connection here to Ogigia and also to Polyphemus in the Odyssey. As a shepherd, he's taking care of a certain type of animal. You may not know much about sheep living in Plymouth. I don't know. But you certainly have seen them in little history books, right? Uh, maybe seen them on, like, Children's Network or something. Yeah, count the sheep. They are white. They are stupid as all get out. <laughs> uh, and they flock together with their heads down towards the ground. Not up, which is significant because we have our head up. We don't go down grazing grass all day. So sheep are these dumb, white, kind of pure, innocent creatures. They need protection. The, sh the sheep themselves Dumb, pure, innocence about them. And notice he's caring for them not for himself but for another man. Because Gygus is a shepherd in the employ of the king of Lydia. So he's caring for the Lydian guy's sheep, not his own sheep. And as a shepherd, he has to protect them not only from the elements, they need protection from the elements and from predators and from their own general stupidity because sheep are, you know, they go and they get their heads stuck in a briar patch or they fall off a cliff and they don't know that they're over the side of the cliff until they're like halfway down. Um, they're just kind of dumb animals in general. And so as a shepherd, you're constantly having to keep watch over them and guard them and protect them. And consequently, his role as a shepherd resembles the role of somebody that we have in our society even today. Who is it that takes care of the sheep? They are the people that feed the sheep, put them out to pasture. Priests and pastors. Priests and pastors have a job of protecting the flock. Have you ever noticed what the bishop what he's carrying when he walks in? And it's not a staff, it's a crozier. A crozier is a curved staff that a shepherd uses to grab sheep around the neck and haul them back when they're getting out of line. Okay? And it's a sign of the bishop being a herder of the sheep. Yeah. So that his role as shepherd resembles the role of a pastor. It is, in a way, somewhat religious. 
He has a quasi-religious role as the protector of the sheep. Now, quick quiz. Who else in the dialogue has referred previously to fleecing the sheep? The guy person. Prosimicus. Yeah. Who says basically that people are like sheep and the tyrant's job is to fleece them. Kind of a brutal vision of life. And here's another quick quiz. What's the the Cyclops' attitude towards his sheep? Eat them. Eat them. Dash their brains out like puppies, right? They're there for me to herd and then kill and eat. So that Polyphema and Thrasymachus are related in terms of the in imagery. And Gaidez and Polyphema are related in terms of imagery. Notice his job is to protect the sheep for somebody else, but in a way, the reference to Thrasymachus and Polyphema indicates to some degree that he's a guy who willingly leads the sheep if he got the chance. Well, in the midst of his shepherdly duties, an event occurs, a miracle of sorts. And all of a sudden, you have thunder and lightning. And an earthquake occurs. He's out in the field, and suddenly, brrr, kaboom. Well, why those two events? Thunder, lightning, and then earthquake. Two events. Why those two events? This is what we call theophonic imagery. Theophonic imagery is basically imagery that, that tells us or indicates that the God, whatever the God is, is present. The God is present. An Apollonian so God would have gold, red, fire surrounding his temple or his ceremony. That would be theophonic imagery. Incense is theophonic imagery. Uh, grapes for Dionysus or um, uh, pork for Aphrodite is theophonic imagery. What shows up in art, or shows up in a temple, it indicates that the god is present. So in this case, these two things are an indication that the god is present. Which two gods are present? Ben? This is Poseidon, the two major gods of Olympus. The god of the sky is present, and the god of the earth and the ocean is present. Now, on the one hand, if that happened, we think, wow, something miraculous is about to occur. Something tremendous is about to occur. And what the tremendous thing that happens is that after this earthquake, there's a fissure or a chasm that opens in the earth. And this chasm opens up, and Gygus wonders at it, he marvels at it. Well, after the thunder and lightning, the chasm opens in the earth. And if we're looking at this thing symbolically, what does a chasm opening in the earth represent? Is it a metaphor for us? He goes down into hell, but the opening of the chasm is not yet going into hell. <clears throat> if a chasm opens up in Mother Earth, what's transpiring? The birth in it. And notice you have the travail before that. Um, that's the whole travail of childbirth. And when the childbirth occurs, the chasm opens and a guy is born into the world. Only that's not what happens. A guy doesn't get born into the world. He goes down into that cabin. It's a reverse birth. And so he actually is he's altering the natural course of things. So this here, the chasm opening in the earth, is, is equal to a birth image wherein a chasm, two gods are present, and a chasm opens up in the earth. And he goes down into that chasm, rather than marveling and waiting for something to come out of that chasm, so that he actually has a reverse of what the natural course of things is supposed to be. I'm going to move over here and just keep your attention for a few more seconds. Or you're just completely on animal phrase. Gygus himself, at this event, it says 
marvels or wonders at it. And this is particularly significant, the word that he uses in Greek. Thaumato. Like a tomato, not quite. Thaumato and thaumato, it means marvel or wonder. And you'll notice how many times wonder or marvel show up in that, that myth. He saw wonder. There are wonderful things. It was marvelous to relate. That wonder or marvel is his immediate reaction. This event occurs, the theophonic imagery, there's a chasm that opens up in the earth. It's a birth image he's marveling at. Well, Aristotle, later philosopher, but a good one, suggests that all philosophy begins in wonder. What he means by that is that when we see the, the when we go through our daily lives and we aren't noticing things, we just blah 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 blah, gotta get the bills paid, gotta get things done. We don't normally stop to think about the world around us. When we stop to think about the world around us and we notice something for the first time, we marvel at it. And we ask questions about it. Why does the sun rise over there and not over there? Why do, do plants grow as they grow in the pattern that they grow in? Why is the human body shaped in this shape that it is patterned, you know, in this shape? Why, for instance, do we say certain phrases or do certain rituals? Why do we wear a necktie, for instance? Well, that's a form of marvel. It's wonderment. It, I wonder why that occurs. And as soon as we do that, we move into the realm of philosophy. Because philosophy is simply trying to figure out why we are what we are. And we have at this moment then the, the opportunity to either wait for the answer or to go down and try and see the answer. And it says that Gygus goes down. He went down. Who else in the dialogue goes down? The yeah, exactly. It's the exact same image. The parallel to Socrates. At the beginning, God bless you. <coughs> At the beginning of the story, our man Socrates goes down to the Piraeus. From the Acropolis, the high city, down to Piraeus. He goes from the white, high, airy, wonderful city down to the dark, miserable, disgusting, smells like fish and body odor, uh, place of ill repute. So it's like going from heaven to hell. And in a way, it's like going down into the dark. Socrates goes down into the dark at the beginning. Gygus goes down into the dark of the chasm that opens up in the earth. It's a similar action. Notice also, by the way, for the record, there's another descendant de Chele said incarnatus est and homophagus est that we're familiar with. Yeah. So hopefully you uh, know somewhat of Latin. I got no clue. Well, this descending down into the earth then. He goes down and he finds down there the bronze horse. He goes down to the earth and finds the bronze horse, which is similar to the Trojan horse. It is bronze, not gold, so it is a, a warlike metal rather than a metal of value. And in that he finds this giant body all naked. There's no armor on it at all. It means that it's unclothed. It means that's the armor. All naked. And it has on it a ring on one hand. And he takes that ring. He seizes that ring. He goes back up with it. So he seizes this ring. And this ring gives him the power to become invisible. And why a ring? Partly because a ring symbolizes unity and unbroken power and also serpentine thought. A ring is frequently an image of a serpent with the tail in its mouth. So it is uh, twisting and turning. Like it is holocaustic. Or Socrates, the unbroken power. Right? Or unity itself. Oneness, like the dyad. One, five, B. Now, the question that I leave you with here is what does this ring mean? What does this represent? Because it helps him to become king. It helps him to see what he wants to 
steal and kill whom he wants to kill. He gets away with murder, literally. But what is this power that he's talking about? If the ring is the ring is certain kind of thought, it's unbroken power, what does it represent? What does the ring, both here and in Lord of the Rings, what does it represent? Because I don't know if it, I'd go, I don't think I'd go so far as to say demonic. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I would not say that. It could be something that can be used for good and evil. I know people says that. Galadriel does too. Well, you have third reading to do for Friday. So go and have fun. Mm -hmm.